is there a monopoly on games that can help teach kids the basics of logic, or is it a scrabble in an effort for a trivial pursuit that might not come to pass? There's always a bit of a risk when it comes to these sort of things. We're going to learn a little bit more about games and gamification in this week's episode of the Data Radio Show. Hello there, welcome to this week's episode of the Data Radio Show, where we're talking games, or one game in particular. Peter Ballas, who's the CEO of Data Vault Builder based in Zurich, Switzerland, well, he's been working on a board game for the last 12 months that's designed really specifically to help teach kids about the logic of numbers and how they work. And it's been a really interesting process for him going from inception out of a need all the way through to working with kids to try and develop the game. They're about to relaunch their Kickstarter campaign, so we thought now's a really good time to sit down and have a chat to him. So Sam and I are going to talk to Peter about what's going on and how it all came together. But before that, check out the video that they've put together for their page for their Kickstarter campaign. Hi, my name's Peter Bellis, and I want to introduce you to our new game, Walty Wins. It is named after the famous robot, Walty. He wants to learn to deal with numbers. And the cool thing is, he brought along his three friends, which are named as well Walty. So it doesn't matter who wins, Walty wins. This game was invented while traveling with our kids. We were playing outside, and the only thing we had were three dice. So we were rolling dice, and the basic game is that you need to find the equation to match a target number. Hello there, welcome to another episode of the Data Radio Show. This week we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to play some games, or at least learn about some games, from Peter Ballas from Data Vault Builder. And I've got Sam Williams here with me as well, who's going to jump on in because he enjoys this kind of thing just as much as I do. So first of all, how are both of you guys going? Very good, thank you for asking. How are you yourself? Yeah, getting there. Long day, long week, long year. (laughs) Uh, excellent. Uh, keen to talk about Vaulty. Yeah. So, so for, for those of you that are watching, we'll show you Vaulty a little bit later. Uh, and for those of you that, uh, that are listening, the blue one is mine. I'm going to be the one who plays with the blue Vaulty because he just, he speaks to me. It's, he seems adorable. Everybody loves blue Vaulty. Um, I, I'm actually really curious um, around how this kind of developed out of data modeling, to be honest. Uh, Data engineering is obviously something that you do at the moment. It's something that you're very involved in with Data Vault Builder. Um, How do you come up with a combination that's, you know, maths and luck? How does that fit into data engineering? Um, I'm just kind of trying to put all the pieces together. So it's a start different bits to it. I mean, the basic idea came up out of needs. We were on holidays with our kids, we've met our uncle and we had no games with us and and they were a little bit bored and and he found like three dice and he had the idea, let's let's roll the dice and just came up with some some calculations to to get to the number of 11. That was the initial start of it. And probably if it would be just that, it would have nothing to do with what we do. But the next day, we started to work with the kids like we do in our product development because they sometimes ask what you do in work and it's really difficult to explain to, to kids what we're doing. So I explained, yes, we're doing product development and stuff like that. And so we started really to, to do a brainstorm session. Then we created some small prototypes just with some pieces of papers and, and the kids came up with ideas how to evolve that, how to invent some action cards. And we started during the holidays evolving this concept in, in an agile manner. And I think this has a lot of to do with what we are doing and really learning this approach of listening to every other to trying stuff to get rid of stuff and, and getting up, uh, coming up with some new ideas. Yeah, you know, I, I guess it's um, one of those challenges that you have um, with young kids is keeping them occupied at the best of times. I, I um, understand that what you've come up with is something that you can you can play easily and any time if you've got the got the cards and the and the dice and the funny thing is that then different people at different ages come up with with different stuff i mean for me it was important that the game is balanced because i'm doing a lot of board games i've played like from the settlers of Catan 
through now the crew and, and stuff like that. We're really playing often. And I know if a game is not balanced, it's really, really bad. It can really, because then you're watching like for hours. So, so for me, I did write some Python scripts. We, we looked at that. We, we did to brute force the number of combinations that you can get, the chances for everybody that everybody gets a chance to win. For the kids, there were different needs. I mean, we have dice uh, in, in the game. And we had three dice in the beginning. And some of the kids were saying, hey, for me, it's a pain to wait until I get my dice and I can roll my dice. So the answer is we have now a lot of dice. Everybody gets his own color. And for me, that was not a requirement at all, but I get it. And it's so much fun if you have now more dice, but we incorporated that into the game that you sometimes can borrow a dice from somebody else. And that was a good idea. So I le really learned to listen as well to people with a completely other perspective. Even you sometimes think, yes, I'm the adult. I should know it. No, <laughs> listen to everybody involved. And I think we should have this as well always with the business users. Even if we assume, yes, we have done this 10 times, we have done this 20 times, listen to them. It might be that they have completely different needs. And the masterpiece of this uh, are these figurines that we have now in the game. Do you, do you want to hold them up a oh. little bit closer to the camera? Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, the green one is bad if you have a green screen. So let's take the blue one. Um, <laughs> all the kids said they need to stay in the game and they need to be better. They need to be nicer. And we say, yeah, but we have no function for them at all. And they say, what function? They're just nice. I like them. <laughs> I want to have them in the game. <laughs> yeah, but they're expensive to produce and everything. You no, know, it needs to be in the game. It, it makes the game fun. Okay, good. Let's do that. And, and this is something that, so I need to say it, it has a lot of to do, not maybe directly with data modeling, but with how we work, with the agile process, with learning on what other people want. And that's maybe good training to do something completely different with a physical product design. One of the, the things that comes through a lot in these conversations is how important logic is actually when you're working in a data field, anywhere in the, in the data field, having an understanding of logic makes everything a lot easier. Um, this feels like a tool to help train kids in how to think logically around numbers and um, equations and, and learning, basically. Is that part of the initial design plan or was that something that's sort of popped up as a bonus along the way? I mean, we realized that they do that. And they came up with stuff like really young kids when like you have to roll the three or two dice and get up with a specific number. And if you have three dice and there is 11, sometimes one kid was always saying, no, that's not possible with what my role was. I'm saying, how can you say that that fast? And he told me, yes, if there is not one uneven number, I can't reach 11 at all. I was saying, okay, they're starting really to building their patterns, deriving it from what they see and not really trying everybody, everything, not brute forcing it, stuff like that. So that was really cool. And what, what sorts of things did you learn about gamification? Like um, what, what insights did you sort of gather around how gamifying something uh, uh, has enabled you to think differently about what you do on a on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of product development? I mean, what we have seen is that even doing nearly the same, like doing a calculation, can be very, very boring. Like you have a sheet, you need to go through, you have no feedback and stuff like that. And here, by adding a social component, you're, you're sitting together with somebody else. You're having something to do with your hands. <laughs> you have colors and it changes stuff. Even if you would say like from an objective perspective, it's doing the same still. They're doing calculations and stuff like that. It's a completely different mindset. The kids even came back and were saying, yes, can we play this game? And they're still coming back and from not every day, not every week, but from time to time we play again because they ask to do this. And I think that's a big, big change. And I think as well, yes, we should bring this into our automation software to as well if we work in workshops. And, and that's what we try to bring in. If we do data modeling, do simple forms, take colors, present it in a way that we bring in the business users, that it's not just a boring, yes, 
post-its work and I really love post-its, but the better it is, the simpler it is. Yes, it's a small change, but it can help to break the barrier to, to, to get going with, with some other users, yes. Um, so uh, one thing that, Peter, you, you wouldn't know about myself is that I'm a certified Lego serious play practitioner. Uh, and so when you go through the, the process of um, learning how to use uh, Lego uh, to help people in, envision um, something new, something different, etc. Um, one of the principles that they talk about there is using your hands um, and that in fact our hands are an intelligence center. Um, and there's a fun term in all of that. We have something called the cortical homunculus, which is the part of the brain that registers what it is that we're doing with our, with our hands. Um, and it's a, it's actually a sensory center that um, people don't know um, so much about and the importance of activating that with certain, with different people. Anyway, it was just an interesting point when you were saying that you wanted something or, or one of the things that came from this is doing something with your hands. And I think one of the challenges around data modeling, data engineering, um, and data analysis is that it's so abstracted from the physical world. Um, I, I just wondered, you know, what your thoughts were on how you make these things more tangible and, and activatable, activatable, if you like, for other parts of our intelligence. Honestly, I would say that's a good question that I need to think about, but you, you're true. And, and if we're talking about the posted experience, that's more physical, yes. So, so maybe that's as, as well as some good aspects. Yeah, I would say that's something that I will give some thought, but uh, <laughs> I don't have answer for you now. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just when you mention that you know the physical playing with the dice, I think that that's probably an insight or an unexpected insight um, that is sometimes r removed, or you know, we in these digital times. We kind of forget about the physical interaction that, uh, and and I I suppose also um, the little figurines are an example of that having some physical representation or an avatar. Maybe that's a better way to sort of access it. And maybe Paul, if you want to ask that question about the the avatar, that sounds thing. really good to have like a physical data modeling kit where you can move around the hubs and the links on the table and i think really that could be something at least as introduction and ideas to touch it that that's a very interesting thought i think i mean all the physical stuff i mean what uh, out of the pieces that you've got is there one that stands out for you i mean all this physical stuff was very impressive to me because so far i, I worked in software i thought was in data modeling yes we, we use paper maybe mm -hmm but I never use physical product. And we tried to get these figurines and we thought about 3D printing, we thought about cardboard and, and cardboard was really out of the, the game because the kids said, no, I, I know that that's in every game. It doesn't look so nice. And we got a company, they print on the same plexiglass front and back. I've never seen that. <laughs> it's, I, I know this if you have really expensive pieces like that you have two pieces of plexiglass and, and you have foil in between and it's, that's glued together and that was too expensive, but they really, they just printed hmm. two different things on top of each other and it's translucent and it's really, really cool. But it gets you a new dimension of problems because yes, we had all the graphics design and there was the color proofs. I knew all of that for printing stuff. And at some point I got the email and they told us, yes, all the games will be ready next week. You can pick them at ramp five. I think yeah, you're in China, I'm in Switzerland. What do you mean by I can pick them on the ramp? I say, yeah, that's in your contract that we put all the games on the ramp. Say, he, he put them in a box and sent them over and say, yes, there are several hundred of kilograms heavy. We count them, just put <laughs> <laughs> in a box. 
oh yes that maybe would be something that you should think ahead and the agile approach you know, is not maybe that the best approach but still it worked out very well so so we, you just get a fried forwarder and everything but it, it gets a new dimension if it becomes physical yeah. is, is it something you've, you've the, the people around you've had to sort of get used to as well i mean you, you work in the abstract and generally speaking, when it comes to things like data vault and, and building data models. Um, but kids, for example, don't necessarily think that way. Has that been part of the learning process for you? Is it sort of bridging that gap? I think so. I, I mean, yes, from kids, I learned so much. I mean, once my son was, when he was very, very young, looked at the car and said, yeah, a car has two, two wheels. I was saying, no, a car has four wheels. And he told me, no, look. And I looked at the car and I was realizing you never see a car with all its four wheels. It's your concept of a car. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or you lie on, yeah, you either lie on the floor or the car is flipped over, but you never see the four wheels. I was saying, okay, yes, that's really, it's, you're not really looking, you're making up your concepts, you're making up your models, and that's completely disconnected from the real world. And it's good in a way, but you need to realize that, that it's not the same, yes. And I just wanted to, to a little bit uh, as well speak about the agile approach. That, that, that's the second thing maybe that, that I learned is that not for everything the agile approach is the best. Because when we were finished with the, with the basic prototypes and, and we were ready to start production, we thought, okay, so let's do as well a Kickstarter campaign to promote it, to send it out to people that, that we talked about it on the world. And, and my approach was, I don't know how Kickstarter works. So let's do like first campaign page, get live and day by day, add some more information, get the feedback and put stuff there. And even there was really not much about the game itself, like one a picture and a little bit of the backstory. In the first days, we got a lot of visits and, and we got as well some games already sold and we really realized like 50 or 60% of what we wanted to achieve. But some people came back and said, are you crazy? You don't know how Kickstarter works. Kickstarter works that in the first two days, you get some attention and they measure how much attention you get and if you don't get enough attention in the first two days, you drop down to the end of the list and you will never make it to the end. And it was fascinating. We even came top in one category and that was on board geek games. That's a web page on, on board games in the category worst Kickstarter ever. <laughs> and the, the funny thing is that usually they really uh, destroy their games and stuff like that and they were saying, it looks like a legit game and it looks like it, it works from what they describe, but what did they do with the Kickstarter campaign? So, but out, the interesting thing is out of such stuff as well, good stuff comes and really three or four people reached out to me, gave me feedback, told me what they usually do, what we should change. And, and really I appreciate, appreciate it a lot because it was not like just bitching around, sorry for that word, uh, but it was really legit criticism where we can learn something from it. And so we, we did a new campaign, we will restart it. We did a video, which we, we watched before that. We can maybe put that at the end of the show, if, if this is possible that everybody can see. And so, yes, I'm really happy to have done that, but yes, probably like building bridges in an agile way is not the best thing to do could be that sometimes a little bit of design makes sense. And I told this yesterday to, to, to a very good friend that's working in telecommunication. And he said, yes, when we did merge all our identity providers into one system, we thought the same. Maybe sometimes some upfront design could help. <laughs> and he's a really, really big fan of agile development. So yes. Probably that's something we should get maybe in a balance. So know that it will work out at the end and then maybe decide on what we can do step by step. Is there anything along the, the process as well that you've gone, well, this is clearly not going to have a connection back to data modeling, for example, like all the spam you get in Kickstarter, when you launch a campaign, you get a million emails from people saying that they can get you famous and get you a million people supporting your campaign and stuff like that. Are there any sort of lessons that you've been able to pull out of what not to do? 
honestly, I'm always concentrating on the stuff what I learned. And, and it's fascinating usually that I do stuff and you think, okay, why I have done that? And, and like two or three years later, you realize that it helps you a lot. Like we, we needed to design this, this cards for the game and it was a really pain. I needed to get into new software. I needed to, to, to learn about proportions and stuff like that. And somewhere later, you just, somebody gets sick, some, some graphic designer that designs something for exhibition and you think, wow, am I happy that now I have some basic skills. I know I'm not a professional. I'm, I'm not claiming that I'm good at that, but at least if I need to move around some, some letters, <laughs> I can do that now. <laughs> so I think it's always interesting to do something new. And I think this is something that we should probably keep in mind what to do to, to keep on learning outside of our field, bring it back to, to these ideas and really have this other points of views from as well colleagues and not only kids that surprised me which kind of ideas they had that that's really great so and that that's my takeaway but yes not to do do you really want to spend so much time on doing something like that that's yeah you know how it is you always think how difficult can that be this naivety <laughs> to to start something but yes no it pays off at the end so one of one of those payoffs is it a better relationship with your kids? Happily, I have already. I believe at least I have a very good relationship <laughs> with my kids. You can ask them how do do they see it, but for sure, I think for them it was a very good process to be involved in something that we created, to have a project, to have something that you finish. Because in school you learn stuff for learning. Yes, it's important, but. The outcome is not something something tangible. And here they see they have created something. And, and the thing to do projects with kids, to let them see what they can create if they participate, if they engage, that that's something crucial. That as well, as you say, with this Lego project, I have seen that as well. If they can build something and they see, and yes, probably it's this part, you can touch it. it, it it's a crucial part, yes, that, that I learned maybe that it's not only the doing, it's as well succeeding at something that you can, that is tangible. So if data modeling doesn't work out, it's in the game development? I don't know. I, I really honestly think very highly of, of these game developers that do big games, that do all the testing, because we have a pretty simple game here with a very, very small purpose. I would never claim that I could do some game like Valbara, like uh, All Little Everdale or something like that, which have like 10 different lines of strategy that you can have there that needs to be balanced, that needs to have a manual. No, honestly, I think that's really, for a good reason, an industry on its own, which is very, very difficult to do really, really good games. Yeah, with the, with the gamification um, process that you went through, um, what were like the most interesting things that you found um, or, or key learnings, if you like, about going through that process of gamification? I really learned how optics and colors are important. That you can do the same game that we have just by printing out or writing down small paper slips. You can do exactly the same. You can take three dice in white and black and the game feels different. And I wouldn't have believed that it as well for me as an adult, adult how big the difference is. Yeah. And the small interaction things, if you need to pass the dice and wait to get the dice, that it's really weird how this changes the game. And <laughs> I wouldn't have believed that. So, and I honestly, after doing that and, and prototyping that, I don't understand why other games don't do that. Like a dice is not the most expensive part of a game. So adding some more, I understand it. If you do thousands of them or 10,000 of them, yes, it makes a cost difference. But if like you have a game that is mainly rolling dice, I would probably think to involve more dice into it because this small part of not needing to, to to give stuff around reduces the amount of time you need to wait. And I think this, that's a crucial part for, 
for some of us playing. That's what we realized. We had a group of, of people, including me, that really, really hates to wait for other people's turn. I know I have this challenge in my life, but really in these games, we, we have seen that. So I'm looking now more for games where you can participate in every step, step if possible, if you can play in parallel. And that's what we have here is because even if the other people have their turn, you can still try to figure out their solution as well. So you're involved as well. So you're not just sitting around. And probably I will play less games in the future where you just need to wait until everybody else decided what they will do until it's your turn again. How do you win the game? Have I? How do you win it? At what how do you point, win it? How, at what point do you go, yeah, you're the winner? Is it the person who gets the most right answers? Is it a timed thing? That That's the funny thing. It can keep going. I always, in the past, I always thought I only game, uh, play games that are not too much luck, where you can win with a good strategy. Or at least there is more strategy to it than luck. Honestly, because I have a good chance of winning such games. But <laughs> this game is pure luck. You have the target numbers, you roll the dice, and if you can reach the number, you get the card. If you get five cards, you have one. So this means with being better or having a better strategy, you can't win. And why is this a crucial part? Not everybody is at the same level knowing mathematics. So if it would be the case that somebody with better mathematics skills could win, the younger players would drop out immediately. So here it's about the process of playing instead of winning. Yes, somebody wins, but it's everybody, every time somebody else. And that's as well why we, you may be heard, uh, I showed you a video before, is we have a, gay, a version for our smaller kids playing with two dice and one for a little bit older kids with three dice. And we really balanced out the probabilities that they win, even if they play together in the same game. And I think that's a really crucial part to having a fair chance. And as well, that's something new that I didn't was aware of that this could be an end in on its own in a game that everybody has a fair chance to win. Yeah, I think it's actually a really interesting and important um, contributor to the potential success, I suppose, of the game. Um, especially, you know, this is definitely one of the challenges in games like Monopoly, for instance, um, where it's it's not great um, trying to play it across different age ranges and different skill levels. Um, or with my ex-wife, she she's a fiend at that. She she collects monopolies. Right, she, she's got about 50 different sets and I will never play her with them because she's just horrible at it. This does not seem like the sort of game she could do that in. I like that you mentioned Monopoly. My wife is never again playing Monopoly with me. You've won then. Because I want to too often. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's my assumption. Maybe she just, she, she just doesn't like the game of creating a Monopoly. Do you know, mm -hmm. by the way, how this game was created. You need to, to read that. It was, I think, a lady that tried to show by the game how bad this capitalism <laughs> is and how it creates monopolies. <laughs> <laughs> At the end, a guy stole her game, sold it to a big game company <laughs> and made a lot of money. Oh, my God. <laughs> It had a little bit of a good twist. At the end, the company came back to her, realized that she was the original inventor and, and paid her some money. But it really, you need to read the story. It's really fascinating how this game came to life and how it became what it is today. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Uh, at least I believe what is so written on Wikipedia. <laughs> I, I, I did I check that, but I, I trust at least that the story could be accurate there. I, I guess you've you've inadvertently come up with the antidote to um, Monopoly um, for those that have Monopoly challenges um, in terms of their partners. So I, maybe we've discovered a, a promotional line that you can use. <laughs> it's not Monopoly. 
<laughs> it's <laughs> definitely not Monopoly. But I have to admit, like, <laughs> sitting down and listening to, to how it works and, and seeing it in action, my first thought was this is the kind of thing I could sit down with my six-year-old grandkid and play. Because, you know, he, he's starting school, he's learning maths, he's doing all that kind of stuff. Smart kid, but I'm not great at maths. And, and so I think we'd probably be pretty evenly matched in that respect. But it could be a really fun way just to sort of sit down and, and you know, enjoy a, a fun game that he's learning in as well and getting those logic steps. And yeah, it, it seems like a really all ages kind of tool to help people. Yeah. And and it's really the case. We are six year old. He started with two dice and he's now already playing with three dice. But yes he he got interested in it i wouldn't recommend it to everybody or to force uh, please never force kids to do stuff like that that that's not the idea it's really we try to do something if they have interest that we can do something with them and and start and show them and we have as well created some videos how to use the dice to to show you like addition by counting the points by doing subtraction by high, really putting your finger on on one dice to subtract stuff like that and the nice thing is we had as well a uh, game tester in Canada and he came back and was saying, hey, that might be good if your kids already know some mathematics and, and they want to train it, but it's not good for explaining it. So so we start to finding out what could be a help to do that. So we will probably now as well create some resources for download to print out like some tables where you can show the kids how it works, how multiplication works like with a small board and stuff like that. So I think that's really cool that people come back with their ideas and if you listen we can really improve stuff and that's as well something that we try to do daily i guess one area i'm curious about is how you could use something like volte as uh, a data engineer to help build bridges um, with different stakeholders in an organization now it it might seem a little bit um uh, lame the idea that you um, play a game together with with different people but just that act of um, playing something like I'm, I'm familiar with game nights for instance in organizations but there's a potential use case here um, for data engineers as they they work with different stakeholders um, to potentially do something fun that um, helps build bridges or connections, if you like, from a team standpoint. Um, I guess I'm curious: have you have you played it um, internally with with your team at at Data Vault Builder? They had to. They had to. They had, they had to <laughs> test the manuals and everything. They, they were forced <laughs> and to because we always needed the, in every version we needed somebody else. So we so we went through the company and uh, like now it's your turn. You need to try it. Um, I mean, we have already a really really small hidden thing is the base of Walti, it's in fact a hub in the data vault builder. But <laughs> I think we need to evolve that and say, really, maybe we can use stuff like that. These techniques that we have, the production techniques that we learned to maybe create bigger plexiglass stuff as we had it with, with the poker cards that we use for, for agile estimation. At least in the beginning, yes, we are that far here in the company that, that we do this just by heart, saying, yes, what are the points? But maybe this could be as well to involve new business user teams to say, yes, you have your elements, you can write stuff on it. And maybe it could be that we have this tactile post-it process, but with some nicer optics. And it could even make this better because then you show, hey, I have prepared something. The post-it process is perfectly fine. It works. Please don't get me wrong. I, I like people doing that. But it looks like you didn't prepare anything. You come with a block of post-its and some pens and say, yeah, now do that. And it could really maybe change as well the impress impression there if you have something prepared that looks really nice. Well, I suppose if nothing else, it's an icebreaker um, for um, team building exercises. No, I, I really need to think about that. that. That's really some good ideas. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so how are people going to be able to get their hands on this? So as I explained to you, I, I wouldn't say that our first Kickstarter failed. I mean, we, we, we were top in one category, even if it's the worst one. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, it's better than not being noticed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 
we have now prepared a second Kickstarter campaign where you can sign up and in about one or two weeks after this show aired, we will start the campaign. So you will get an email, hey, it started now and we will be happy for everybody then participating in the campaign in the first two days because that would be the critical part. So we will see if this works out this time. Yes, we will as well work on our social network before the start of the campaign and not after, which did work. But yes, as I say, it's, yes, we are learning. That's that's the main thing I hear. I can recommend Playing a great learn. place to start telling people about this. It's called School, the Data Innovators Exchange. Perfect market to tell everybody about what's going on. Good. We'll do that as well. Well, yes, and um, I'm looking forward to game night some sometime on on in the data innovators exchange so um i guess one of the things that we wanted to offer up was the opportunity for people to get their hands on uh the the game uh and to support the kickstarter program so um when this video goes out um or this talk goes out um you'll be launching on Kickstarter again, and that's the easiest way for people to um, get involved. Exactly, but you mentioned that everybody listening here to this show will have the chance as well to win one of the Walti games. So we will give you some information as well, how you can sign up for this process, and we will have a draw and give away five of these games everybody else will just get the link to the kickstarter campaign and can sign up there but yes it's it's an idea to get this as well going and, and hand out some of these games to people that are really interested can Perfect. podcast hosts apply for the game competition <laughs> <laughs> yes but then we need to see how we do the drawing that it's really fair and <laughs> that's understandable that's very understandable yeah i know uh, yes i say i I've learned heaps. I can't wait to see this in action. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be very exciting. And I think it's a really valuable tool for people and for kids. It's always important to get kids thinking logically and getting them interested in the base foundation of what they're going to need going forward. So yeah, well done on all the work. It's absolutely impressive. Actually, one one last question, Peter. Is there a digital version of the little Volties? No, not at all. That That's really even... And that's a first, that, that you see the back of Walti, I think that's the first time you see it really in this game. This doesn't exist in any other web page, <laughs> any other materials that we have, <laughs> maybe for a good reason, but... <laughs> I don't know, Volti NFTs? Yes, there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, we are maybe too late and, and he's not a monkey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been absolutely brilliant. But I, think, <laughs> but I just... One last thing that I now thought about is probably what really, why I as well like to, to game this is that you get instant feedback when you're playing, if you're right or wrong, because that was maybe something that, that in school drove me crazy. Like if you were like writing down your exercises, you hand it in and your teacher, I don't know, one week later or two weeks later gives you something. In the meantime, you didn't know if you did it right or not. That was really terrible for me and probably and as well, this is probably what we do with data modeling. What we try to do is to do the same process. If we model, we try to give the business users the feedback immediately. That's why we're doing like the real time transformation of data models into working code. And yeah, maybe that's a little bit what connects this game with what we're doing here <laughs> at our company. Brilliant. Peter, Sam, thank you very much for joining me today for the episode. It has been incredibly informative and highly entertaining. Uh, we'll organize details to get a way for people to be able to enter the competition. And I won't enter just to be very, very safe and make sure nobody thinks that I'm pulling it. I, I will send you just one copy Perfect. <laughs> from my personal. Perfect. But I thank you a lot. It was a great pleasure being here. Uh, I always learn as well something talking to to you guys so thank you a lot and see you hopefully soon thank you very much thanks peter hey guys thanks for watching this week's episode it was really fascinating learning about that gamification process 
and how kids can bring something a little bit different to the table when it comes to creating something like this, but also how those children informed the way that adults think and perceive things. It's a fascinating view of the world and maybe sometimes we all need a little bit more childlike wonder in what we're doing. Hey, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell everybody about the video. There's actually a link in the description below to both the Kickstarter campaign and the competition that was mentioned. So you can learn a little bit more about the game down there and you could win a chance to actually have a copy of the game for yourself. It's going to be a lot of fun for everybody. Until next time, live long and prosper and may the force be with you.